You're listening to the world famous Chick Whisperer podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Here we are once again for episode number 57 of the world famous Chick Whisper podcast. I am your host, as always, Scott McKay, coming at you from sunny San Antonio, Texas, home of the San Antonio Spurs. We're rocking it in the playoffs, even as we speak right now. And with me today is a new friend of mine. I just made his acquaintance for the first time a couple weeks ago when we were at a mastermind meeting in uh, terrific uh, wild Las Vegas. And uh, you know what? He and I made fast friends. We have a lot in common, and I knew immediately that he had to be a co-host on this show. So I want to introduce to you from Woodland Hills, California, Greg Palumbo. Greg, how's it going, my brother? It's going great, Scott. Thanks so much for having me today. You know, Woodland Hills is pretty sunny also. It sure is. We had a beautiful day today. Yeah, I think every day in uh, Southern California is beautiful. I can't complain. Well, we're headed out there in just a couple weeks, so... uh, We're going to enjoy some of that weather ourselves because it's fixing to be about 100 degrees daily come about July 1st. So uh, that's a good plan. But enough about me. Um, Here we are. We're going to be talking about something a little bit different today because what you've got going on, Greg, is so blasted unique that I just think these guys have to hear about it. You are one of these guys who absolutely walks his talk. And uh, there is no doubt about it. One of the many reasons why we became friends. And uh, I think it's going to be a very special program in the good way, not in the short bus way. And um, can't wait to get on it with these guys. But first, as is our custom around here, we're going to listen to a voicemail. This one comes from Raj in Washington, D.C. And uh, here's what he's got to say. Hi, Scott. My name is Raj, and I am calling you um, about this question. So, I love, first of all, I love your show. I think uh, there are a lot of shows out there that talk about tricks and manipulation and all of that. But what I love about your show is that it's all about working on yourself. I think that's such a positive thing, and I believe in that myself. So I just absolutely love it. So my question to you is, when you are dating and when you find somebody who you think you click with and there is a relationship there, how do you kind of figure out to really see if this woman is kind of a long-term potential woman? Like, you can see in your heart that you could live with her or be with her for a long time, but is there any tips, any signs to watch out for that could also be used? Well, all right. Now, you know, that is actually a question that I get a lot of emails on. Um, Almost every day someone asks me something similar to this. But, you know, I'll tell you what, Greg, I'm not sure we've really covered it on the show. And it's such a huge question. When you're trying to find a great woman who you want to build a long-term relationship with, I mean, what should your list of must-haves look like? And what should your list of deal breakers look like? I mean, you're a happily married guy. So am I. You've got a beautiful family, by the way. Thank you. And, you know, you've done well for yourself. What were some of the items on your checklist? Or was there even a checklist? Did you just kind of throw a few uh, blades of grass up in the air and see which way the wind blew? Or did you really find yourself being intentional about who it was you fell in love with? You know, Scott, I I actually was intentional. And I had something that at the time was a very simple rule. And that was what I called the 10 year rule. And that is, if I had a disagreement with somebody that I was dating, if I thought that I would remember what the content of that disagreement was in a decade, then that's a deal breaker. But if all I would remember is, oh, yeah, we had some fight, I can't remember what it's over, then that's probably a person that's good to be with. I know, I know that sounds a little jaded, but I just felt like nobody's perfect and you're going to have disagreements. And I've learned more and more in my professional life that that's just the natural part of life. And so you just have to figure out the substance of those disagreements. Are they deal breakers for you? And it's going to be different for every person, but that's what I think you really need to get your head around is, is this issue 
just something we're having a tiff about, just kind of like picking a fight because, you know, every once in a while that's what happens. When you're in close quarters, familiarity breeds contempt. They say that. It's true. It happens. Uh, but if that's something that's a fundamental issue, like, I don't know, like, you know, your mate really wants to go to that crack party and you just uh, aren't interested in that kind of thing, um, that's probably a deal breaker. It's probably a relationship not to pursue. Yeah, I'm assuming you're not talking about repairing breaks in cement. Oh, I was. I'm sorry. Were you speaking of a different kind of crack? I'm, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> well, the kind of crack that you see when the plumber's fixing the sink? <laughs> that kind of crack, right? That would be a deal breaker for me. It sure would. You know, another thing, Scott, that's very interesting, and I think some of us uh, guys that are in our 30s and 40s um, heard a lot of early on, and that is opposites attract, you know, and there was a big song by Paul Abdul just on that subject about opposites attract. And we thought that that was the right thing, you know, find that person that's totally different and, and you know, make a life with them. And you were even hearing that from some psychologists back in the early days. But what we've heard definitively now, we found definitively, and studies support this, that you really need to find someone as like-minded as possible with you. So you don't want to find the opposite. You want to find someone that shares as many commonalities and interests as you do. And I think that actually does tie, you know, because that's something I've learned in recent years by reading recent studies and in my work in the mental health field, I've heard that. But, you know, I do think that ties into very nicely my early days simple theory of will I remember this in a decade? So I would really caution people from finding that person that's just so different from them, thinking that it might be some exotic and wild trip, but it might just end in ruin because you don't have a lot of common ground. Yeah, based on both of the factors you just mentioned, I've got comments on each. First of all, when you're talking about that 10-year rule, I don't think that's jaded at all. I think that's pretty darn profound. Because what that does is it really gives you an excellent litmus test, a yardstick, if you will, for saying, okay, look, is this something foundational or are we just cranky? Because, you know, if we're just kind of tired and haven't eaten dinner yet and this is about what to watch on TV and, you know, you always watch Lifetime. No, you always watch sports. That's one thing. But if it's like, you know, for the 40th time we're arguing about what church we're going to go to on Sunday or something foundational to how you're really truly going to get along or even be compatible. You know, you eat meat and you need to stop because meat is murder. Well, you know, I don't have these teeth in the corner of my mouth because I'm a vegetarian. You know, that's the kind of thing you're going to remember in 10 years because it's foundational. And I love it. I think that's a valid yardstick. The second thing that you mentioned is the likes attracting versus opposites attracting. You know, I have a funny story tied to this. I have emailed eHarmony trying to get someone to tell me if their top secret test for matching people up, you know, woo woo, woo is based on likes attracting or opposites attracting. And they can't tell me. It's got to be one or the other, right? Interesting. Well, what I've been able to gather is they believe that likes attract. Of course, if you take a Myers-Briggs test and read what Kiersey and some of the other psychologists have said about that test, you know, people who are opposites in Myers-Briggs tend to attract each other, right? So that is kind of interesting also. Here's my take on that, and I'm not sure I've ever given this on the show. I think both likes and opposites attract. In other words, I think you can meet someone who is like you in some ways and opposite from you in other ways and have a brilliant relationship where you truly, if you want to use the gosh awful phrase, complete each other, that can be an effect even as you are in lockstep on some other things. Here's how I would separate those two factors out to be something meaningful to a man and a woman who want to be together. First of all, if it's something in terms of how your worldview is structured, what your religion is, how you spend money, how you save money, um, whether you're incredibly a neat freak or, you know, you're really messy, how many children you want to have, stuff that really could cause a major rift if you disagree about it long term, that's where you need to be in lockstep. That's where you need to figure out whether you're compatible at that fundamental baseline level or not, because otherwise you're going to have 10-year fights like you were <laughs> talking about. Where do you want to live? Oh, I want to move to rural Alaska. Well, I'd rather live in Phoenix, Arizona because I like to be warm. The two of you aren't going to get along. You've got to figure that out. So opposites. I'll give you a great example of opposites. 
Emily and I find ourselves on long plane flights quite often. She'll bust out with a Sudoku puzzle book. Dude, I would rather watch the Miami Heat play 16 times in a row <laughs> than play Sudoku. I would rather do taxes than Sudoku because – or I don't even know how to pronounce it. What is it? Sudoku? So, I never got Sudoku. that straight either. I would rather do taxes than Sudoku because at least you have something to show for it at the end. You have work done. This chick, my wife, can sit on a plane for 14 hours and play Sudoku the whole time. you got to be kidding me. But, see, she's a numbers person. I have to edit all of her newsletters because she's not much of a writer. She's just not into it. It's not her thing. So I'm the writer. I'm the speaker. Emily does the taxes. She's the accountant. She's the one who figures out, you know, how the bills need to be structured and who needs to get paid this month for what. You know, she's the one who is keeping order around here. And God bless her for that because that is not my gig. Meanwhile, she's willing to let me talk when the police pull us over in foreign countries and things like that. And I genuinely and generally get us out of it. That's where you're completing each other. I have a skill that you lack. You have a skill that I lack. Both of them are necessary in certain circumstances and they help us be a better team. Another thing would be, hey, I'm interested in doing this fun thing and I've got some experience at it you're interested in doing these other fun things. So like, for example, we don't both have to be interested in, say, ice skating. We both don't have to be connoisseurs of Thai food. You can introduce me to ice skating. I can introduce you to Thai food. And together, we increase our level of experience and our quality of life. Emily was not a motocross racer. She was not much of a world traveler, and she wasn't exactly excited about singing karaoke in front of real live people when we first met. Now she's a whiz at all three of those things. And of course she has shown me some things that were exciting going on in her life. And we've incorporated that in. That's where you can be different. I don't think we have to like the same exact kind of food. I do think that if we have a foundational difference, like I'm a vegetarian, you're not, that's one thing. But like if she wants to eat broccoli and I don't, I think we can get past that. So yeah, those things are very important. Raj, I'm going to add some other things that are I would say a little bit more visceral, okay? I've talked about some of these on the show before, so we're going to just power right through them, okay? The first one is she's got to like men. Don't get saddled up with a man-hater. Don't get married to a woman who has any sign of serious mental illness at all. And I know some of you out there are probably going to come to the rescue of some of the people you know who have uh, suffered from mental illness and say, yeah, well, you know what? They can't help it. It's an illness like diabetes or anything else, and... You know, those people need love too. Great. Just not from me. Look, you're talking to a guy who was married to someone who had clinical schizophrenia and it was not something that was going to allow that marriage to stay together. So think twice very much about getting into a long-term committed relationship with someone who is not in the same reality you are. It's not going to end well. That's another thing. The next is watch how this person spends money. Watch their attitude towards money because this person can either break you or help you become more financially secure in the future. That's very, very important. Just see if they're positive or negative in general. Are they good to people who they don't have to be good to? The classic example, of course, is waiters and, you know, do they kick the dog or are they nice to animals? Look at all of that stuff. And, of course, the flip side of all those things you're looking for that are good would be the vices you're trying to avoid. And I think that's pretty basic. Raj, you've asked a great question, and I do have one more thing to add. This is something that I get a lot of flack for when I start talking about being friends with women. But listen, guys, the problem with our attitude towards being friends with women is we're usually thinking about just being friends with women, a la the just be friend zone. Look, you can't be in an adversarial relationship with women and expect to have happy relationships. This is not seduce and conquer radio you're listening to. So this is my educated opinion on it. But I'm telling you, it bears itself out in real life. Because if you don't like women, then guess what? You should be a deal breaker for any woman who's trying to get into a long-term relationship. Just like you should be avoiding women who are man bashers and man haters. Greg, do you like man haters? No. They're not attractive, are they? They they just, they're closing themselves off to a fairly significant part of the population. Right. So this has a lot to do with your self-esteem 
if you feel like you should get beat up in life, you may end up with a man hater. Women who have poor self esteem and not a whole lot of self respect are the ones who get saddled up with guys who are, you know, narcissistic personality disorder, uh, guys who just think women should be beaten or used, you know, and they feel like that's what they deserve. Have a healthier mindset. You are not a bad guy just because you're a guy, you're a man. You're either a good hearted person or a not so good hearted person, as we've talked about on this show before. You do not have to put up with a woman who's got a bad attitude on that. And yes, as far as friends with women go, you don't want to be in the just be friend zone, but the bad word in that sentence, the naughty word in that sentence, the four letter word in that sentence literally is just. Just be friends means there is no sexual chemistry there. You have not ignited her femininity with your masculinity. You're just friends. And you know what? She probably doesn't even mean that. I did a newsletter about a week ago on being friends with women and how guys who have solid history of having a lot of female friends tend to make women hornier. And I got people completely blatantly disagreeing with me on that. Now, my question to them is, okay, how's it going for you? You got all these women who just think you're incredibly sexy and are dying to throw panties on stage when you're performing? Because, uh, you know what? I doubt it. If you can't build an alliance with women at the baseline level, you're not going to make them horny because you can't make them feel comfortable around you. That's the problem. So yes, Raj, find yourself a woman who you're friends with. Find someone who can be your best buddy. And then yes, when nobody's looking, go rip each other's clothes off and pound each other like little furry mammals. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, peek into your bedroom, Greg, but tell me if you disagree with anything I just said. I, I'm all ears. I hear what you're saying loud and clear. Okay. So, Raj, what I'm going to do, after being long-winded about that, but it's something I'm passionate about, all right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you something really cool. And this is going to come from Mr. Greg Palumbo. And, uh, Greg, what do you got for me? Well, Scott, what we have for Raj is a great program that I think helps not just in terms of how you feel and how you are presenting physically, but how you feel and present emotionally. Because ultimately, when you're looking for the right mate in life, you are, in a sense, a magnet. You're attracting someone based on who you are. And so you want to be your optimal self. And I know you've been talking about being your optimal self as well. And that's a big part of what we do uh, is really work on your entire self, optimizing the different parts of yourself so that you are the very best that you can be. But one of the things that we are very in tune with over at My Neck of the Woods is that people don't have a lot of time. And the time that they do have has to be invested very wisely. And so we specifically seek to develop products and techniques that help people get the results they want, both physically, emotionally, whatever it may be, but doing so in reasonable lengths of time. And so we do have a program for Raj. It's called My Mobile Minute. And this is a phenomenal program. If you have a few pounds to lose, if you're like me, I had 70 pounds to lose. Uh, nothing had ever worked for me. And this was a technique that's totally different. And when I say that, I mean completely. Scott, you've heard the technique. Is it totally different? Absolutely. But it makes perfect sense. And it does, right? And that's the most remarkable part about it is that it actually makes sense, and after you've heard it, you think to yourself, why hasn't everyone just known this and been doing this? So it's a great program. Again, it's called My Mobile Minute, and we'll get that to Raj free of charge, of course. So you mean My Mobile Minute has nothing to do with signing up for T-Mobile for two years or anything like that? No, you got nothing uh, to do with your mobile phone, but a lot to do with how you can be mobile in your life in a different way than you've ever imagined. And I promise that. I guarantee that. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and leave it a surprise for these guys about what my mobile minute actually means. And with that in mind, guys, you can go to a special URL that I've set up to find more about my mobile minute and read more about Greg and see what he looks like and all that good stuff. That's www.thechickwhisperer.com front slash MMM for my mobile minute. And I'm doing that because we've already had another Greg on this show before. That was uh, Greg Greenway. So I'm just going to go ahead and make this MMM for my mobile minute. So thank you, Raj, for sending us that great question. It certainly uh, stoked a pretty spirited conversation. And uh, Greg, great stuff on that. And what I'm going to do for you other guys is if you would like to send us your voicemail and have it responded 
to on this show by myself and my illustrious co-host in the future, whoever that might be, go ahead and call the following number. Plus one if you're outside the United States. Area code 210-362-4400. Once again, that's 210-362-4400. No one will answer that line. It will be a voicemail. And what you will do is you will leave your name, where you're from, and then tell us your email and spell it out for us so that in the event we do use your question on this show, we can send you a cool prize. We know exactly where to send Raj's prize to, that My Mobile Minute program, because he was so kind to include his email. Uh, It's pretty much as simple as this. If you don't include your email, we won't be using your email on the show because we won't be able to give you a prize. And then, of course, you'll be upset because we use your voicemail on the show. You're going to be wondering where your prize is. And, of course, we can't send it to you. And, of course, we want to keep the politics as neutral as possible and have you guys still like us. So just kind of, you know, (laughs) abide by the guidelines and everything will be cool. As far as your message goes, do what Raj did. Keep it short to the point. If you want to say you like the show or tell us who you would like to have me invite as a co-host in the future, by all means, let me know. But then ask your question and make it something that's relevant to as many guys listening as possible. That's very important. And then be clear if you can. It's really all there is to it. With that, I think it's time to segue into the meat and potatoes of this particular episode, Greg. And uh, what we're going to talk about is how to reinvent yourself as attractive. Now, I think these guys have already figured out by the uh, little bit that you've spoken about what you're into with my mobile minute and things like that, that you're a unique guy because you're in the health and fitness field, but you're not just about weight loss or building muscle. You're also about having your emotions in check, having your mindset in check because you believe all of that kind of adds up to you being a person who's in better shape, period. It all kind of works together. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that is the first step to really grasping what we're talking about on this show, which is reinventing yourself as a more attractive human being in general to women. Go for it. Sure. And definitely, Scott, I think I have kind of a unique perspective on this. I would first say that I intellectually understood that you should have a balanced body, balanced mind, that you should, you know, be working out and be doing things mentally, you know, have that balance in life. That was something that made sense to me. And I think as humans, a lot of times we think that just because we know something that we're doing it, you know, it's like even the diets that I would start, I would start a diet and, and, you know, I would be good on that diet. If I'm being honest, most of one day, right? Uh, But, you know, I keep talking about how I'm still on this diet a week or two after I'd really not been on it any longer. As humans, we kind of do that because we're we're intellectualizing things. We're saying, well, I know that if I do deep breathing a couple times a day, that relaxes me and that'll lower my chances for all sorts of diseases that are stress caused. And we think that just because we know that, that it's the same as doing it. And what I learned over the course of the last three years is that there is a radical difference. But even more important for all of you busy guys out there, I'm so busy, it's, it's ridiculous. And I know every one of you are just as busy, if not more, than I am. Now, for you guys that are super busy, there isn't extra time in the day to go devote to some kind of task, some new way of being. You know, it sounds great to practice yoga every day, but really, are you going to take the hour every day? Or it sounds great to get to the gym every morning before work, but are you really going to get up every day at 4 a.m. to get to the gym? Every day. Because what I learned, folks, and this is actually as scary as it is empowering, what I learned is if you don't do it every day, you will not get the benefit. Now, I see them, they're in my community, guys that haven't started doing this yet, and they're still going to the gym at four in the morning, and I look at them, and I look at the way women are looking at them, and the way I look, and the way women are looking and acting toward me, and I say to myself, how unfair, this poor schmuck is getting up at four every morning, and he's still got a pot belly, and I'm doing a 90-second little thing. And I look like a teenager in the peak of their athletic condition. Now, I can vouch for that. Isn't that something? That's what I learned about consistency, Scott. Consistency really is the the lesson that I learned. 
yeah, you can't change your habits unless you have consistency. I mean, that's such an obvious statement, but I don't think people really think about it. No. First of all, if you're going to spend an hour a day trying to get good at something, you're going to run out of day by the time you finish trying to get good at everything you need to get good at. I mean, there's a limit. All of us have, what, 16 waking hours if we're taking care of ourselves and getting eight hours of sleep at night. you got to probably go make a living. You've got to have some downtime. You've got to uh, take care of your family. You know, you've got to spend time with the people you love. Really, if you've got three hours a day to devote to stuff you need to get good at, you know, you better pick three things in this life to get good at. It's just Very not a tenable mindset. If you can get better by spending smaller amounts of time or even multitasking, then that's the way to go. And of course, you know, if you're going to be a virtuoso guitarist or a great actor or learn a new language, you're going to have to put the time in. If there's a better way to help you create new habits than just beating your head against the wall, go for it. Now, one thing I want to go ahead and lay on the line for these guys. I'm sure some of these guys said, hey, well, you know, he's calling these guys with a pot belly, you know, what's the word you use, schmuck or something? <laughs> <laughs> I meant that. And he's talking about how way. he looks like a teenager and women are looking at him differently. Look, this guy, fellas, has earned the right to say that because he's lost 70 pounds. Oh, I was that he's schmuck. He's about my height and he outweighed me by about 20 pounds at my worst. And now he's lost 70 pounds. And I think I would use the word svelte to describe you. You do. You look like, you know, you're probably one of these guys who can fit into his size 28 jeans again. I do. Actually, that's exactly it. You know, right. but I do want to dovetail back to the more important part because, you know, the physical was is great. It's fine. Um, but the more important part, what I was getting at, that consistency, Scott, on an emotional level, what happens here, and this starts happening right away. It took me 11 months to lose 70 pounds, which is you know about the right amount of time to do that. But it didn't take anywhere near that amount of time for me to start feeling the amazing reactions to this. Because we use a metabolic trick. Obviously, if you're only spending a few seconds at a time doing something that other people are spending an hour plus – you have to do it in a specific manner. So we use this metabolic trick. But what that trick does is essentially keep you elevated metabolically your entire waking day. Now, over time, that optimizes your internal body systems. Things like your proteins, your enzymes, your hormones, all of those factors that are attributed to longevity, to vitality, to youth. Those molecular structures are most optimally being rebuilt, repaired, and created when you do this particular activity that we have discovered. And when I say that discovered, I kind of feel like it really is discovered. We didn't, we didn't invent anything. All this knowledge has already been out there. We just kind of put two and two together. That's when people learn this. They go, wow, of course that makes sense. But the cumulative effect, talking about the emotional effect, within a week or two, because your metabolism is boosted, again, the way you felt like when you were a kid running around town all day, that feeling is not just a physical feeling. It's in a psychological state. So you start feeling right away like you're on top of your game, like you're in the best condition of your life. And the interesting part about that is, is it outpaces what happens actually physically. So you'll start feeling a lot, lot more transformed than you actually have done so far. But there's a positive to that. Your confidence is through the roof. So it's not, it, you don't have to lose every bit of the weight get into spelt form, as you put it, to feel that feeling. You're already acting from a position of extreme confidence because of this metabolic reaction that you essentially keep burning all day long. And Scott, I'll give you guys a kind of a hint here. Um, the guy who developed the exercise part of this painted a really vivid metaphor for me, and that's this. He said the way people eat and exercise right now in this present day and age is really counterintuitive because we literally will eat after having no activity at all. We relax, we sit, and then we eat. That's against the way we evolved as people, as humans. Humans are hunter-gatherers. We were meant to go hunt our food and then devour it. Instead, we've developed a culture where we've done the opposite. We've developed a culture where we cram a whole bunch of exercise into one section of the day. That's not how we evolved. We evolved 
with periodic spurts of exercise. Look at your kids, if you have kids or someone else's kids, if you don't. The kids that are in great shape, they're not at the gym an hour a day, and they aren't on the Atkins diet. They're just not. What they're doing is this basic activity. And I'm telling you, when you do that, over time, the emotional part, that stuff that meditation and yoga, for some reason, that stuff also starts to happen to you. Your reaction times will improve. We're talking about being attractive to women and finding the right women in your lives. I mean, when things start to happen, when you're starting to behave physically as you did 25 years prior, and yet you have the mind of a 30 or a 40 year old, all those experiences, but you're in a body that's moving around like an 18 year old, what do you think a 30 year old, 40 year old woman starts to think in her mind? What do you think she, who do you think she's going to choose? The guy who's got that great experience and all the great wisdom and he's got all the things that she may want or that same description except in the body of an 18 year old. And I don't mean, you know, like the look, you know, nobody wants, there's some people that want to date people that look a lot younger than they, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a spirit and I'm telling you guys, you can have that spirit literally in two or three days. The one thing is you cannot get the program and then go, hey, you know what? I understand it and it's working for me because I understand it. You have to actually do. And because we've made it so quick and easy and simple, it really is. It doesn't get any easier or quicker. The commitment is so low, you can be consistent long term. So this is actually an opportunity. It really is. And I know it. And now that, you know, we just launched this very, very recently, Scott. I think it's been October 19th was our official, like, in beta launching it just to show people how we package this. And, and because it's a simple concept. How do you package the simplest idea that's ever been? So that's a hard thing, believe it or not, Scott. And people are just raving. It's not just me. I'm not some genetically mutated guy that, oh, this works for and it won't work for anybody else. I'm so average. It's crazy. It's such a bonus to you guys that actually are motivated, that follow through on things. Before Mobile Minute, I was the worst follow through if that's a word, that ever has been on this planet. I mean, I was wasting all of God's opportunities by being absolutely the worst at following through at anything. And I had read all those, those great books about being the manager this and this, that and the other. I intuitively and intellectually understood what it meant to follow through, but I wasn't doing it. I start doing this mobile minute thing. Not only do I lose 70 pounds, not only do I have the spirit and the essence that I did when I was a kid again, but I, I'm following through with things and not... Not like in the way that in the past when I had to and it got to the point where, oh God, I put that off so long that it's now a raging fire. I got to go put it out. No, I, now I do things proactively and I'm a follow through proactively. Which is also attractive. Uh, it, right. That would have to be attractive to women. I know, I'll tell you that transition for my wife doing this has made a night and day difference, especially with my wife. Yeah, there's so much you're talking about here, and you're clearly very enthusiastic about it, which I love. One of the things I want to go ahead and let the audience in on, you guys were listening. Greg is talking about his product a lot here, and we're not necessarily pitching the product by talking about the product, although I'm sure if you want to check it out, you'll love it. The thing is, what Greg's talking about here in terms of his personal experience and what he went through is so absolutely mission critical and central to who he is as a person now that it's his heart and soul that he's put into my mobile minute, which is why it's really hard to separate talking about the experience from talking about what's in the product because they're sort of one and the same. You and I were sitting there hanging out at the Aria in Las Vegas and we were talking about our families and you had an epiphany of sorts because you were working hard, getting fat, getting sicker, which I can relate to, you know, because you and I both spend a lot of time in front of the computer and it can just start getting away from you and you deprioritize your health and you deprioritize your mental sanity and even your mental clarity by not sleeping and the like and not eating right. And then you just don't get up and you don't go out and you don't exercise. You don't see the world you get so wrapped up in your work and you start slowly neglecting your family and you love these people. These are the people you love. And because they love you, they don't interrupt you. 
And because you're the man and you're supposed to be leading, your wife's not going to butt in and change things. And it isn't because she doesn't love you. It's because you're supposed to get this handled yourself. But guys don't have a handle to grab. And what you did is you found the handle. You found something you could hold on to and say, all right, look, you know what? Now I'm going to take control. I'm going to grab the handle and I'm going to pull it and we're going to move forward. And you see, I think that's where this whole idea of transforming your life to be more attractive is really where the rubber meets the road because all of a sudden you're saying, you know what? I want to feel better. I want to be healthier. I want to sort things out in my life because now I'll have time where I didn't have time before because I have more energy than I used to. My priorities are different. And uh, your relationship with your wife and your kids has improved. I'm sure they still loved you. Nobody was tearing your head off. You guys weren't fighting or anything. But your, your wife's got to appreciate how much more attractive as a person, both physically, emotionally, and, you know, and I would even add mentally onto that because of what you've done. And I'm sure it inspires your family to be healthier because, again, women are following your lead. What are some of the other ways that you got transformed here? Because I want these guys to have the benefit of sort of hearing in an objective way what this transformation entails, not just what it looks like and the mechanics behind it and the discoveries that you made to get there, but what did you transform? Obviously, you lost 70 pounds. Obviously, you're spending more time with your wife. You look better. You have more energy. Your priorities are different. What else was actually transformed? Or, you know, what else are you in the process of transforming? You may not have completed the journey yet. But yeah, and I think away. that's that's a great point. We kind of are always on a journey going somewhere, and that's what makes life so wonderful and interesting and engaging. I think that your question has so many levels in terms of – and. I, I don't want to sound like I'm pitching a product because really, you know, I could tell you what to do. Do 90 seconds of exercise before you eat. Okay, just do that. Now, there's specific ones that will be much more effective than if you make up your own and all that. But, you know, I'm more than happy to share. That's my whole mission in life is telling people just do this before you eat and you will see massive transformation. What transformations? Well, you know, you mentioned the physical that was also health. It startled my doctors when things that they had said would be permanent and only would get worse actually disappeared completely. Um, and those included a prostate issue, which scared the daylights out of me. You know, I'm a 40-year-old guy, and he's saying, well, we don't have to do the ream thing yet. I'm like, what? You know, you, or you have to be on this acid reflux pill the rest of your life, and weaning off of that was actually impossible. You know, I had a heart arrhythmia thing going on that – just was annoying to me and very scary because it would never get caught when I got to the doctors. And so I just felt like I was a walking time bomb, developing ulcers, bursitis, as I think I mentioned. Um, it just, I was a wreck physically. And all of those things, I think especially noteworthy, the ones that aren't supposed to be reversible have disappeared. The bursitis shocks me because I have a surgeon friend who actually went for surgery on his shoulder for the same exact thing. We had the same thing. We're standing there with the same restricted motion. He goes and does the surgery. We see each other. To this day, he says, oh, yeah, I still feel it. I don't feel anything, which is theoretically supposed to be, I guess, impossible, but it's not. It's just the continuity of consistency that will always win out. But these are all physical things. I really think that the most interesting place is where the physical bridges the emotional. Reaction time has been very, and that's where I do believe the two get bridged. My, that's because it's, it happens without you thinking. My reaction time has improved so dramatically that in a couple of instances, it actually saved my, one of my, both of my daughters at different times from, I'm going to say, significant bodily harm. Not death, but, you know, I really saved the day. And it happened automatically. And I could tell you right now, the old me, first of all, would have been too bulky to have done anything in time. And I would have never seen a... Con I mean, this reaction happened before I was conscious of it. It happened... That happened twice. A couple times things have happened where, you know, guys that you're 
you're out to dinner with and you catch a bottle on the way down to the floor without missing a beat and, and taking your time at it. And they're like, w you know, people have that literally taken notice of how quick I am. And again, I'm not doing anything to improve that per se. But, you know, that was the bridge between the subconscious and the, and the conscious. What's happening mentally and subconsciously, I think, is, uh, is so profound it's bridged mentally. I now find myself able to handle a lot more, uh, both in terms of stress. When stressful situations come along, I just go into an automatic deal with the situation. That's very different than the old me. Um, I also see that mentally in terms of being able to calculate and predict how that relates to improving my financial life has been dramatic, how I'm able to assimilate different ideas. You hear people talking about guys, and you know, we hear these ideas all the time. A guy will say, yeah, I tried this, was great. Another guy will say, yeah, I tried that. And in your mind, you're going, yeah, those are great ideas. I should do them. What I find is now I actually start implementing these things that I hear. It's just a cumulative effect. So mentally, my confidence level is just absolutely through the roof. I also think that somewhere in there, you learn a great sense of humility, which is a perfect combination. For these purposes, I know that I'm not being as humble as I am in my general life, because for this purpose, you need to hear what I've gone through and how it's affected me and how I am feeling full of life and brimming with energy and, and you know, I'm not a guy that likes talking about the things that I think you want it and need to hear. Before this whole transformation, and this is a mental thing, although you'll go, well, that's totally physical, but no. Sexually, I was just tired, tired. For, they say 40 years old and yeah, you just, and the woman's at her peak and you're not, and you just kind of go, oh yeah, that just happens because you're 40. No, it, it's not because you hit 40. It's because you, you've been consistently beating yourself up. And Scott, when I tell guys this, they kind of, I don't know if they believe me or not. If you remember what it was like for you sexually at 18, I live that again now. It, it's actually an absolutely wonderful thing because now I have the level-headedness that age brings to not just go following him around everywhere. But again, this isn't something I feel comfortable talking about with in my daily life, but I know you guys are interested in that. And we hear about Viagra and all this other stuff. I was a candidate. I actually tried it. Viagra actually didn't work for me. I was that far gone. And so, um, you know, this has brought me back to that stage again, guys. Um, oh, another one. Guys, you'll love this. And again, in mixed company, I can't talk like this at all. But I would go into the stall and go pee, right? And I'd hear some of you guys have streams that sound like fire hoses. And for me, because of my prostate issue, it had gotten to the point where it wasn't a dribble, but it was like there was no sound really. And I know that sounds silly, but it kind of is a thing of manliness. And you feel, I don't know, it's something that I felt something about that, that I knew that I had an issue going on. I'm hearing guys, and that's not the way I sound. And this is my manhood. And, you know, it's all connected. And so this all is emotional. And that stream, oh, and some mornings, I'd sit for three, four minutes before anything would come out. And that's why the doc was saying, well, we don't have to do the ream thing yet. But, you know, it was torture. That's completely gone. You know, I, I'm not a six foot five guy, so I don't have the fire hose sound, but I got proportional. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that that, you know, some of the things that are physical, I've now learned what it means that they're tied together to the mental. Because when you're super consistent at a physical activity for great lengths of time, it doesn't matter that it's just a short little thing. It has this remarkable blossoming effect in your life. And so you will have mental positive effects, emotional positive effects, and that will transcend who you are in life with your children, you mentioned, Scott, with your wife, with the people that you work with. I get so much more done now because I'm so much different to work with. Again, humility for some reason, for me, and I think if it's not a natural part of this uh, process, you know, then it's something you should definitely foster in life. Humility is super important because I found that also the more humble that I am, the more I, I'm getting the things that I want in life and the satisfaction that I want. Gratefulness. Gratefulness. 
uh, that's a big thing, guys. I'm so grateful that I'm not dead or really close to it. Down that path would have not been a good path. It wouldn't have been a good path for my relationship. We're talking about relationships. I probably wouldn't have been married at this point. It's all tied together, guys. Again, not to pitch anything, but if you start with something simple and easy and quick and manageable, something that you actually can follow through with every day because it only takes a few seconds, that consistency is something that blossoms harder and more, uh, just, uh, it's a larger bloom than I could have ever imagined. You know, I've enjoyed listening to you talk about all of this, Greg, because it's just so inspiring. You're so completely enthusiastic about it. Here's what's occurring to me, you know, as the host of this show and with 56 other episodes under our belt, I'm going to go ahead and spell out a few things for guys that I think they're going to relate very well to having listened to this show in the past. Guys, we talk about the big four. That's confidence, the ability to make a woman feel safe and comfortable in your presence, being a man of character, and of course, being masculine in the way women define it. Do you know what makes women sexy to us? They look healthy. You know, sick chicks aren't attractive. And you know, we know women who should be cute and they're kind of sickly or, you know, they suffer from a lot of ailments. And, and you know, we're not as hot for them as when some chick shows up and just bam, she just looks healthy because those are the kind of women who we look at and say, man, I would like to procreate with her. (laughs) Or I would like to do the act that leads to procreation with her. Greg, you're talking about getting healthy. And what I think can't be missed here that we have to underscore is if you just start with real motivation to get physically healthy, your mental health, your emotional health, and nuances that you didn't even plan for in terms of trying to improve or even knowing that you needed them improved, you know, because you've either boiled the frog for so (laughs) long or you just flat out didn't think of it. All that stuff starts sorting itself out because your body's feeling better, because you're being better to yourself. You're changing habits that contribute to you being healthier. So look at all the things that happen. You're more clear about what you need to do today, which means you're more productive. Productivity leads to being a better leader, a better father, a better provider, a better protector. All of that stuff's attractive to women. Boom. There you go. Another thing is you had these physical symptoms that you're talking about. And man, you know, yeah, you were too sick for a guy who's 40, dude. I really was. Too much going on. You start worrying about that. That starts consuming you and the worry and the stress about how sick you are makes you sicker. So you've got to reverse that. And if getting healthier physically starts taking the symptoms away, and you know, I know this from direct experience, by the way, I won't go into it because you basically did the heavy lifting for me. But as your symptoms start clearing up and you start feeling healthier, you worry about those symptoms less. And then that expedites the process of clearing them out. So the next thing you know, what you've done is this one little simple action like you talked about. And, you know, again, your gig is basically, I mean, there's a lot more to it, obviously, in my mobile minute. But your gig is basically exercise 90 seconds before you eat. You start with that one thing and the whole domino effect goes. The snowball starts growing and you get more attractive in all these different ways we're talking about. Your reaction time. You're a better protector. You know. All of these things, these little things that you get better at, these things that improve, make you more attractive. The next thing you know, you're healthier, you're mentally stronger, you're better looking. You know, you're talking about women looking at you who didn't look at you back when you weighed 215 pounds as a five foot six guy. Yeah, that just never happened. You know, it is true. And it's not, guys, how you look as much as how you think you look. Yes. Your confidence, the fact that you feel more like a man. All of this stuff ignites femininity, like I call it. Guys who feel fat and sick aren't big four. They're not confident because they don't feel good and they know they don't don't look good. They're not as capable as they used to be. They're feeling that. And that translates to not being as masculine as you could be and not being able to make a woman feel safe and comfortable in your presence. And you know what, guys? If you have the character, you will do something about it. If you're letting yourself go and letting yourself go, it's a character issue. So it really does come full circle. Greg, we've got to wrap this up, man. You've said such amazing things and you know, you've gotten me excited about it. I'm of course on my own personal journey with this. I'm doing my mobile minute and, um, awesome. 
you know, I'm already pretty well recovered in many ways from where I was a few years ago. Because, you know, getting married to a woman like Emily who can eat like a Hoover vacuum cleaner, not gain an ounce and having a couple kids and doing what I do for a living with the career change, you know, it all started adding up and it caught up with me. It was literally like the whole boiling of the frog. <laughs> And, you know, I did the process of starting to reverse this a couple of years ago, and I've already seen huge differences. And, uh, yeah, sexually, it's a huge difference. huge difference. In terms of your energy level in general, everything you can get done that you used to not be able to get done, it's like having an extra five or six hours a day, literally. Um, I've got a five-year-old son. I've got a one-year-old daughter. I can keep up with them. I can play rugby on the carpet with my five-year-old son and not feel like my back is going to explode. Not having my bones creak, not getting up in the morning and feeling like I'm 80 years old. And, you know, of course, taking a multivitamin and making sure you've got your nutrition in order is another whole part of this equation. But guys, take that first step because you're never going to be able to shake a stick at everything you need to get fixed. If you start making this list of, okay, here are all the things I need to do to be more attractive. Here are all the things I want to do. You're still going to miss half of the benefits you're going to get that, yes, do make you more attractive from taking that first step of saying, I'm going to care about my health. That, I think, is the biggest takeaway from this entire show. So, guys, if you want to learn more about Greg, and by now I'm sure you're just basically champing at the bit to do it, www.thechickwhisperer.com, MMM. Once again, that is thechickwhisperer.com, front slash MMM for my mobile minute. Guys, Greg Palumbo is a real deal. He's my buddy for life. Um, real glad to have met you, Greg, and thank you so much for being a co-host on the show today. It was my pleasure, Scott. Thanks for having me. And guys, if you haven't gotten your hands on female persuasion, you can take your new, more attractive, reinvented self and become the master of making women want to do anything for you. That is an incredible skill set to have in life. So go to female-persuasion.com. That's female-persuasion.com. Get that special report on how to make women feel more safe and comfortable in your presence and learn more about female persuasion. Uh, it's already becoming one of my most popular programs and guys are giving me rave reviews on it. I've already added several new uh, audios to it also. So if you've looked at it before but haven't seen it in the past month or so, go ahead and take a look. And remember also, we need your voicemails. Uh, we like to do one every show. We need a good one every show. So go ahead and give it your best shot. Once again, the number for that is area code 210-362-4400. And uh, guys, you know what? I will talk to you again on episode number 58 of The Big Show. Until then, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications. Be good out there. The Chick Whisperer Podcast is copyright 2009 by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to sign up for the X and Y Communications newsletter at www.thechickwhisperer.com. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Chick Whisperer Podcast.